Good morning, everyone. Pastor Casey has started his sabbatical. We miss him already. <laughs> what I'd like to share with you this morning uh, is a message about the providence of God. Uh, not surprising to the folks in my Sunday school class that we share because we're going through a book by Stephen Charnock right now in the providence of God. So that, that thought is definitely uh, with us, is definitely with me, and I find it to be an incredible source of comfort about all things that happen in the world. Um, it, these are certainly troubling times uh, in, in many ways as we read the news and see what's going on. We see world leaders around the globe who not only approve of evil but celebrate it and try to enforce it, it, try to force that evil upon all of us as uh, across the world whether it's sexual theologies that are completely contrary to scripture and again being celebrated and trying to be indoctrinated throughout the world uh, we see other things, too. We see aggressive military behavior going on. We see there's a war in Ukraine where, where Russia has, has invaded for the past year or so, and there's threatening that going on throughout the rest of Europe. There's China that is uh, being very aggressive militarily in, uh, in relation to Taiwan. And uh, if that's not enough, we just see leaders even of our own nation who are ungodly in, in so many ways and, again, trying to spread that ungodliness in a very forceful way way. We also see attacks in Christianity. Uh, I've just heard this morning that there's uh, an addendum or perhaps a new version of Fox's Book of Martyrs coming out or something similar along those lines because we have so many modern day martyrs and persecution going on even around our own area. Uh, we certainly see that to our neighbors up north with pastors being arrested for preaching gospel truth. In our own country, over 300 Catholic churches have been vandalized since 2020, uh, since May of 2020. So just three years, past three years, that many churches have been vandalized. Uh, and, and we see that Christianity is demonized, if you will, that um, if we speak good of scriptural things, we are thought evil of, and, and vice versa, that if we proclaim truth about sinful ideologies, sinful thoughts, uh, then we are demonized and thought of as, as being wrong, be on the wrong side of history, if you will. Some people even shut out from their jobs because of their beliefs. So we can be confused. We can be fearful uh, unless we get a firm grip on the providence of God, the fact that he runs everything in this world. Uh, this passage that we're going to look at today, Isaiah 45, the first seven verses, a little snippet is, is a sample uh, of God's providence being screamed throughout Scripture. Uh, so let's dive into this as we, as we look at this to see what the Scripture says about God's providence and see how it is that that can be so comforting and how, how that affects us in our daily lives. So follow with me, if you would, in Isaiah 45, the first seven verses. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Please pray with me. Father, as we dive into the text this morning, uh, 
uh, and pull out the truths that you reveal to us. You have so graciously and wonderfully revealed to us through your written word. I pray that you would help us to have insight, help us to learn more about you, more about your working, and more it is, Lord, how we can respond to you to glorify your name. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Before we dive into the text itself, when I say God's providence, what is it that we mean by, by God's providence? And one definition that I like, was, I thought was pretty succinct, comes actually from the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. And, and in that document, uh, the, the men who put that together define God's providence this way. God, the good creator of all things, in his infinite power and wisdom, does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures and things, from the greatest even to the least. Hebrews 1.3, so speaking of Jesus, tells us that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. In other words, God isn't just a creator of all things. His creation shows his incredible power as we look at the mountains, as we look at the hills, the seas, the oceans, the universe. But he's not just a creator of all things. He is the sustainer of all things and is actively, and here's a part that we really have to grasp, what I'm really trying to get to today, actively working everything that happens in the world according to his perfect plan to achieve his purposes for all of creation and for the good of his people and the glory of his name. Let's dive into the text here and see, what, see how we can, we can parse this out some more. Um, a little bit of context with Isaiah 45 here. When we look at uh, chapter 44, uh, God is, in all through Isaiah, he's speaking this, this theme kind of over and over again. And in chapter 44 in particular, he speaks of his election, how he has chosen Israel. They didn't choose him. He chose them to be his people, his providential care for them throughout their entire history, from at the time that from Abram's promise to the prophecy that they were going to be in captivity for 400 years, for their miraculous delivery from that to the settlement in the, in the promised land, and all through their history, his providential care, his uniqueness. He says this repeatedly in Isaiah that he is God and there is no other. In chapter 44, he goes on about the foolishness of the idolatry, how they, they cut down a tree the, with half the wood, they, they burn it and they cook with it, and the other half they carve an idol and they worship it. He says, stupid. It's the impotence of these idols as well. And then he goes back to his redemption of Israel. That though he chastises them, he tells them he's going to redeem them. He's going to make them his. He's going to bring them into closer relationship with him. And then he talks about the rebuilding of the cities of Judah. The end of chapter 44 just kind of flows. The last verse or so flows right into chapter 45 where he begins to speak about the King Cyrus. At the end of 44, he says, Of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. So now when we get into verse 1, we, again, we talk starts out with talking about King Cyrus. And first of all, we ask, who is King Cyrus? Um, he was uh, the king of Babylon at one point where he conquered. Uh, we read of Cyrus in, in the book of Daniel. Because, I, again, we want to note that in verse 40, chapter 44, he speaks of him as his shepherd. In 44, he's 45, he speaks of him as his anointed. So we read about him in the book of Daniel. We learn that Daniel served the king's court just as he served Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and a series of kings. He, he served Cyrus. And the book of Ezra starts out that very way. It starts out how in the years of King Cyrus, it was his proclamation to send the Jews back from captivity. Cyrus's proclamation is to send them back to Jerusalem, specifically to rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. So as we look through the first three verses here, some, I think some pretty noteworthy things. First of all, when he, just the fact that he names Cyrus, Isaiah wrote these words 150 years before Cyrus was born. Okay, 150 years before Cyrus is born. So we're going to look at the detail of the prophecy that was fulfilled by King Cyrus. Um, and, and first of all, his name. His name. Can you think of anything more, more intimate between a husband and a wife than, than picking the child's name and, and how that would be directed for 150, 150 years before that, yes, you and I just decided, here's what we're going to name our baby. Directed to specifically by God's providence in choosing that very name. 
It says that God grasps his hand, whose right hand I have grasped. Uh, and it shows that he subdued the nations. So here Cyrus is. He's, he's conquering nations. He conquered Medes, Lydia, the Assyrians, the Arabians, the Cappadocians, and, and, uh, and many others as a series of nations that he, that he uh, uh, conquered. And finally, the great Babylonian Empire itself. God says, I took his hand. I took his hand that he would conquer all these things. Uh, how is it that Cyrus was able to do that? It says, God loosed the belts of the kings. God opened the doors before him that the gates would not be closed. It was God who enabled him and who was guiding him and directing him and ordaining that he would, in fact, conquer all these nations. Some of the details amazing in verse 2. He says, I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. The Greek historian Herodotus tells us that the gates of Babylon were made of brass. So even the fact that Babylon made their gates of brass and, and Cyrus then tore them down was predicted specifically in this prophecy written by Isaiah over more than 150 years before it occurred. In verse 3, he says, I give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places. One of the kings that uh, Cyrus conquered was uh, the king of Lydia, Croesus was his name. Uh, and he was known, he was legendary for his wealth. Uh, he was supposedly the first king who actually uh, standardized gold and silver coins and minted gold and silver coins. Again, legendary for his wealth. And even to this day, in some, cir some circles, people talk about he, he is as rich as Croesus. There's a saying about that because at that point he was thought to probably be the wealthiest man in the world. And Cyrus conquered him and took his wealth just as God had prophesied that he would give him the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret. What's wonderful, it's not that really God, it's not that God just doesn't see this and prophesies that it's going to happen, but he commands them. He ordains them. He directs everything that happened in those years leading up to Cyrus, leading up to those kingdoms, leading up to the fact that he was going to conquer them all. By his providence, he would bring every, by God's providence, he would bring every tiny detail to pass in order for these events to take place and for the prophecy to be fulfilled, exactly as he would say it. So, again, ordained it brought it to pass, prophesied that it would happen, and then made sure that Cyrus fulfilled everything in every detail. Whether it's the naming of the king, the conquering of the various kingdoms, including Croesus and, and the, the king of, of Lydia with all his wealth, gathering all that, and even the Babylonian gates being made of brass, ordained by God, prophesied, completed by him. What's interesting is that there's no indication that Cyrus ever knew God in an obedient way, if you will. He never became a follower of Jehovah. But yet twice, and we see in chapter 44, and again in chapter 45, he says, God calls his pagan king my shepherd. He calls him my anointed. Why is that? God uses even unbelievers as his chosen instruments. Okay, he used Cyrus to fulfill this finally, and specifically, fulfills sending the Jews back to Jerusalem to rebuild. It was his chosen vessel that he had decided and ordained hundreds of years before that this was going to happen. So he uses unbelievers as his chosen instruments. So during that time, yeah, he was his anointed. He was his shepherd because he was accomplishing his will in detail. God had a very specific role for Cyrus to play, and that role was for the gracious purposes towards Israel. So the naming, the conquering, the enriching, everything that happened was for the purpose of blessing Israel. God ensured that Cyrus was equipped to accomplish his role. Again, it says he took his hand, if you will, and loosed the belts of the kings and made sure that they were able to conquer. He made sure that he accumulated the greatest wealth, known wealth at that time, certainly in that area, perhaps in the world. And, and that enriched him so that he could easily afford sending the Jews back to Jerusalem. Did Cyrus recognize that he had been chosen by God for this role? Well, I think the answer is clear. Yes, in, in Ezra chapter 1, verse 2, this is Cyrus speaking. He says, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, 
has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So, I mean, how did that come to happen? Well, we know that Daniel was in his court. So my assumption is that Daniel told him, showed him the prophecy of Isaiah. I mean, here's, here's this king coming who does everything in complete fulfillment. And, and you can just imagine Daniel reading the scriptures and saying, this is incredible. This is happening. Here it is. Here's a complete fulfillment in detail. And at some point, again, using my holy imagination here, that he went to King Cyrus and said, oh, king, look at this. I want you to read the words of Isaiah that were written hundreds of years before and see that you are the man that God has called here at this time. And here's the purpose. Here's why he has called you. So it's undeniable to even a pagan king that Isaiah had prophesied very specifically about him. So again, whether or not he came to saving faith, there's no indication of that, but he could certainly say, yep, that there's no doubt that that was written about me and, and therefore I will fulfill this. In verse 4, of, of Isaiah 45, we read, For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen. He says, And also he says, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. Again, the lesson there is God uses pagan kings. God uses pagan leaders for his purposes, very specific purposes that he planned and ordained beforehand. Now, although there's no indication he ever became a true worshiper of God, he recognized what was happening in his life. Pagan instrument, pagan kings then and today are God's instruments. Also in verse 4, we see that Cyrus was chosen by God and used by God for what purpose? Very specifically in verse 4, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen. Everything that Cyrus did ordained by God, not for the purpose, not for the good of Cyrus. If he did not know God, he would wind up in hell for all of eternity, but for the, for the good of God's people. John Calvin writes, God on high governs all things in such a manner as to promote the benefit of his elect. Everything, everything in the world. Think about the billions of events that occurred from the time Isaiah wrote this to the fulfillment of it that all interwove to make this thing come to pass. John Piper uh, wrote, if I'm quoting this correctly, that God at any moment in time is doing 10,000 things by his providence. You and I might be aware of two or three. Uh, and that was occurring throughout history in here. The entire purpose of everything that occurred in the life of Cyrus, ordained in very detail, and every detail by God, was in order to benefit God's people, strictly for the purpose of Judah. In verse 5, we see a theme that's a constant refrain in the book of Isaiah, that God declares his uniqueness and his absolute sovereignty. So he points all this stuff out that he was going to ordain, he was going to prophesy and say, look, I am God and there is no other. Nobody else could do this. Only God could accomplish this. Uh, and, and we see this. says, I am the Lord. There is no other. Besides me, there is no God. And that refrain in chapter 43, verse 11 says, I, I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no Savior. In chapter 44, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. In chapter 46, one of my favorite passages, 9 through 11 for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Okay? Declaring the end. Here's what's going to happen to Cyrus. Here's who he's going to be. Here's what he's going to do. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, a man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. I love this passage too because even, even though we're talking about kings and conquering countries and these big massive things going on, he also says, I call a bird of prey from the east. He, he sent the ravens to Elijah. He, he runs, he, not a sparrow falls without his knowledge. Everything is run by him. As we read each of these verses in context about the uniqueness of God, God's declaring his sovereignty and his providential care over everything in his creation. The context of every one of these is look at the things that are done, what I have declared, what I will do. It's me. It's God. Nobody else could do this. Only an omnipotent, omniscient God, all wise God could possibly do this. He describes examples of how he commands every detail of every event throughout the world from how birds fly to how kings conquer. He is sovereign. 
Then he goes on in verse 5 to declare how he raised up an unbelieving king to serve his purposes. He says in verse 5, I equip you, though you do not know me. Even though he never knew him, even though uh, he paid no attention to, to the living God, he equipped him uh, for everything that he was going to accomplish. And we can see that even in the New Testament or with, the, uh, with Pilate coming. Pilate speaking to Jesus and saying, don't you know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus said, you have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. So Pilate's authority at that moment in time, he was raised up specifically to send Jesus to the cross. And Jesus said, no, there's nothing you could do apart from the authority given to you by my Father. As we continue on, we get to verse 6. In verse 6, God declares his purpose in making this prophecy and in using Cyrus. He says that people throughout the world, from the rising of the sun and from the west, okay, from the east and from the west, may know and recognize that he is God. How undeniable and unmistakable it is to see God's omnipotence, omniscience, om, om, every, everything about him other than seeing this prophecy fulfilled hundreds of years later in every tiny detail. It says, God says, I've done this because everybody now can see that I am God and there is no other. Everybody from the east, from the west, believers and unbelievers and like, believers as us, unbelievers, even like Cyrus, who became the, what we call the, uh, we've got a friend in, in James, it says, even the devils know that there is God and they tremble. So Cyrus had what we call devil faith, okay, that uh, he believed the same as the devils. He, he, he knew that, yes, God had brought this about, but he did not worship him. Verse 7, as we continue going on, it makes it clear that everything that happens is from God. Everything that happens is from God. I mean, think about the terrible things in warfare as, as Cyrus conquered all these nations. Um, hard for us to comprehend but yet, ultimately from God's hand, ultimately for his purposes. Again, John Calvin writes, God alone is the author of all events. That is, from adverse and prosperous events are sent by him. Even though he makes use of the agency of men, that none may attribute it to fortune or to any other cause. Ultimately, always everything from God. Author John Oswald writes, there is only one first principle. And he is light, and he is good. Only one first principle. Even over the things we don't understand, over the evil, do not come directly from the hand of God, but they, they are ultimately his first purpose. He is the first cause of that. So while we may not understand why calamity is happening, we do, not, we do know who ultimately controls it. And we know certain things. We know that he is good. I can't understand what seems horrible and terrible to me, but I know who controls it. I know he's good. I know he's good. I know he's loving. I know he's merciful. And I know he's very purposeful in everything that he does and everything that ordains for his glory and the good of his people. And, and Deuteronomy 29, 29, <laughs> I quote that. All the time, we can't understand why bad things happen. That's, you know, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed to us belong to us and our children that we may do the words of this law. So we can't understand why bad things happen, but we know, we know the character of the one who controls all things. Having marched through these, these verses here, um, now that we've seen how an all-encompassing God's providence is, Let's think about what it means for you and I. How does this apply, this, this passage here, to you and I? Uh, first and foremost, that we've got to understand, as, as it's clear here, that God is at work for the good of his people. He's actively at work. He directs every detail in creation for the good of his people. Again, Calvin, God never forgets his church whose salvation, on the contrary, he promotes by hidden means. By hidden means. Think about again the years that the pagan King Cyrus was battling and conquering kingdoms. Did any of that ever look like it was going to be for the benefit of Jerusalem, of, of, of Israel? Uh, but it was as he, conquered, uh, as he conquered the Assyrians, as he conquered Lydia, as he conquered King Croesus, as he went through every one of those that was happening. Those were completely hidden means to God's people. They had no idea that this would ultimately be for their good. Today, it means for God's people. It means his church. It means First Baptist Church Slidell. This means you and I 
individually and corporately as God's people, as we function as a body of Christ, that he is ordaining everything in all events of, of life in this world today for his glory, for our good, at corporately and individually. We can see in Cyrus's day, it was specifically to send the Jews back to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple. It, it's nice when you can see all these things. And, yep, here, here's all the things that happened, and here's exactly why it happened. You and I don't have that, that luxury right now. We just see things. We're, we're in the days when turmoil and t tumult are going on, but we don't see it. It's not so clear to us today. So perhaps God is purifying his church. I don't know. Perhaps he's deepening our faith. We know that's always going on. And he's deepening our dependence on him. We know that that's always happening as well. We can see those purposes, even though we don't see some ultimately concrete end that, that we can see as, as Isaiah wrote about. We do know that God uses suffering to mature his people. That's all throughout the scripture. And to deepen them, to make us walk more closely with him, and to, to refine our faith and to mature us. Uh, during the former days of persecution in the first few centuries, Tertullian would write, would say that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. So we're obviously not being murdered today as they were in the first few centuries, but as Christianity loses favor more and more, we have to stand stronger and stronger. We have to be a brighter light in a darker and darker world. We stand out and shine more brightly as the darkness gets darker. Perhaps that is what God is doing today. I don't know. Uh, but we know that those are some of the purposes that he's always working in his church. So whatever God is doing today, we know that he's directing all of the world's events today for the good of his church. Another lesson I think we need to bring out of this is God uses unbelieving nations and unbelieving individuals as tools to work good in his people. That means that the current leaders, whether they're in Russia, whether they're in China, whether they're in the United States, and every person who leads today anywhere in any country on the face of the planet, no, no matter how crazy and evil they seem, are put there by God for his purpose for the good of his people. Stephen Sharnock writes, it is unfit that we should affront God in the use of men and suggest to him by our attitude that he had done more wisely in placing another and that he had done foolishly in placing this man or that man in such a charge. Sometimes men are unworthy of the place they fill. They may be set there in judgment to themselves and others. But the wisdom of God in his management of things is to be honored and regarded. We can often sit back and say, God, why would you put that person in charge? Certainly, if this person was in charge, everything would be much better. And certainly, certainly the better way of doing this. Sharnock writes clearly that, that the, he puts unworthy people in places of authority because he's using them for his purposes. The wisdom of God and the management of things is to be honored and regarded. Even though God is providentially at work and will definitively bring about everything that he has planned, it doesn't mean that we just kind of fold our arms and stand by and watch. Say, God's providential. Everything is happening is by his, his world. He's ordained it, so I'm just going to sit back and watch. Um, we can say, first of all, that we still have to pray. Okay? God uses means. Even though he is providentially directing all events of life, he uses his people. He uses means to accomplish his own purposes. Uh, Daniel chapter 3, we read that Daniel was reading and said, oh, the 70 years is almost up. Now, he could have sat back and said, wow, this is awesome. I'm going to set my watch. It's almost over. I'm going to watch and see what happens. But what did Daniel do? He prayed, he fasted, he prayed fervently. Matthew Henry writes on Daniel chapter 9, Daniel learned from the books of the prophets, especially from Jeremiah, that the desolation of Jerusalem would continue 70 years, which were drawing to a close. God's promises are to encourage our prayers, not make them needless. And when we see the performance of them approaching, we should more earnestly plead with them, plead them with God. We know that we pray according to his will. He, so certainly Daniel knew that he was praying according to God's will. So we looked at what is the will of God that I can pray, that I can be part of his means to accomplish his purposes. So again, we don't have the clear and specific prophecy that Daniel had where he could look up 70 years, time's about up. Okay, uh, I guess I can pray now that this specific thing is going to happen. And look, there's a guy named Cyrus on the horizon. Maybe he's going to come. We'll pray for all that. Um, uh, but we do know, we do know that in the midst of all the craziness and evil going on in our world today, that God is working out some plan for his glory, 
and the good of his church, the good of his people today. Uh, in his book, The Invisible Hand by R.C. Sproul, uh, Sproul writes, God ordains the means to the ends as well as the ends themselves. So he even ordains our prayers in order to accomplish what he ordains to happen. Can't fully wrap my brain about this, but that's what Scripture clearly teaches, that we should pray to bring about God's will. Jesus told the parable of the unjust judge. Specifically, it starts out, the unjust judge, where the widow was knocking on his door, hey, give me, you know, give me justice. And he says, no, I'm not going to do it. Finally, he says, okay, because she's such a pest. I'll go ahead and answer. But, but he starts out by saying the purpose of this parable is that we ought always to pray and not lose heart. So we can pray, and we cannot see what things are going on, or we cannot see the answer to our prayer directly, but we know that if we're praying according to his will, we ought not to lose heart. We ought to continue to pray. Similarly, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells us to pray for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a, pe a, excuse me, lead a peaceful and quiet life. And, and he says in many times, as well as in Colossians 4 as an example, he does in several other places as well, to continue steadfastly in prayer. So we are to continue to pray for godly things. What should we do? We should pray, pray for our government leaders. What? That we should lead a quiet and peaceable life. Uh, we should pray for our church leaders to lead us in wisdom and lead us in godliness through these turbulent times. Pray for one another that we would be spiritually strong and witnesses uh, to an evil world. Again, we're, we're encouraged in, in Ephesians 6 to always continually pray for one another. And, and pray for yourself. Pray for yourself that you would grow in godliness and that you would glorify God in your life. In, in James 1.5, he talks about seeking wisdom, and the context of seeking wisdom is in the midst of suffering. So what's the, what's the wisdom that I need? The wisdom is in the midst of my suffering, Lord, Lord how can I glorify you? What, what are you wanting to grow in me? How are you wanting me to change? How, again, can I respond in a way that glorifies you to a watching world? So God ordains by his good providence, but he uses our prayers as well. So one big lesson, continue to pray. We still have to be, another lesson is that we still have to work, and we still have, still have to be mindful of the enemy. Though God brought the Israelites into the promised land, uh, they had to fight. They had to fight their way through it. Now, God used Cyprus to supply everything needed to rebuild the temple, but as we read the books of Ezra and we read the book of ne Nehemiah, we see that, that, that they did the hard work, that they looked, they surveyed, they built, they formed teams, they built the wall, and they had to be prepared to fight an enemy who was trying desperately to stop them from achieving God's will, which, again, we know they could not have done because that was a God ordained that that would happen. But, but that fight was going on. So as God does his work in our church right here in Slidell and in you and I, we will encounter opposition to God's work. We'll encounter opposition to God's work from unbelievers, from those who hate God, uh, from Satan who stirs up our own temptations to compromise, to lose sight, and to sin. Part of our work now, which is part of the means that God is using to accomplish whatever it is that he's doing, is speaking truth, speaking truth to an unbelieving world, speaking truth to, to each other as well, and being firm to contend for the faith that was once delivered for the saints, as we read in Jude 3. So, so we are to be strong witnesses for the world, preach as Noah preached, uh, and, and contend, but yet and, and, uh, and support one another as well. We want to live our daily lives in a way that glorifies God. How do we do that? In the little things of life. We train our children. We work good for the nation. We work good for the area in which we're in. We see Daniel in Babylon that was prophesied in Jeremiah 29. Look, you're going into captivity. Build houses, plant gardens, live there for the good of the country. So, so we are to, to do good for our neighbors. We are to live godly lives, train our children, and, and build our lives in a way that glorifies him. It, it's a mystery. You know, we try to wrap our hands around this. You know, who can understand God? We can't. God ordained everything that Cyrus would do, yet Daniel's prayers were hindered by Satan, and Nehemiah's work was hindered by earthly enemies. But God uses means to fulfill his own work. They still had to struggle. They still had to pray. They still had to fight to accomplish what God had ordained will pass. He uses us to accomplish his work. So let's be aware that even as God is working out his providential plan for the church, for us right here and for us, we're in a spiritual battle. And like the Jews who built the wall with a sword strapped to their thigh and, and, a, and the trowel in the other hand, 
We must maintain a wartime mentality. Know that the enemy is always at work trying to discourage us, trying to tempt us into sin, trying to, <clears throat> trying to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. And I think another picture is just as half of the workers, when they were building the wall, half of the workers stood by in full armor in the shield, while the other half worked, again, with their sword strapped to their, their thigh. Similarly, I'd say, let us here, let all of us be alert for the attacks of the enemy. Pray specifically for someone else right here in our church. Pray specifically for one another. You know people who are struggling. You know people are struggling with suffering, with sin, with, with some kind of discontent, with something bad going on because the enemy is at work and our evil hearts are at work. So just as the, the people who were building the wall were standing guard, I, I would contend that we need to pray for one another, to strengthen one another, again, that we could accomplish God's will to, to our, uh, in our own lives and to a watching world. Don't get discouraged about the need to struggle. And, and I think that's another, um, another lesson that we get from this passage in the building of the walls in Ezra and Nehemiah, that God has ordained all this. God has ordained. He's doing something, but yet we still have to pray. We still have to struggle. God is at work. He's using your prayers and your struggles to grow spiritually as the means to accomplish what he is doing. So let us not be discouraged because his will will be accomplished. He is providentially working out what he will work out. Uh, and part of what he's working out is the fact that he uses us in, in spiritual battles, in prayer, in strengthening one another, encouraging one another. I, I think lastly, I think the most important lesson to gain from this passage is that we can find peace. We can find comfort in the fact that God is providentially caring for every detail of every event in the world today. As crazy as things are happening right now, as, as incomprehensible as they are, God is at work. God is directing them, every event of every detail. And he's directing them all, what? For the good of his people, for the good of his church around the world, for the good of First Baptist Church Slidell, for the good of you and I individually. As Sharnock and Sproul likes to comment, used to like to comment, there are no stray molecules in the universe. Everything is controlled by God very purposely, very uh, providentially, but very deliberately for the things that he is doing. So let's remember the refrain in Isaiah. He is God and there is no other. He is God and there is none like him. And I'll close with this, this beautiful benediction from uh, the book of Romans. It ends, Paul ends, in, or it doesn't end up in, in Romans 33. At the end of that chapter, he writes, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, your ways are incomprehensible. Uh, but yet, Lord, the things that you have revealed to us give us such comfort, such peace, because we know that you are providentially at work in everything that's happening in our world today, just as you were in the days of Cyrus, the days of Isaiah. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to remain faithful, to remain strong, to never get discouraged at the battle, but to know that you're, you're at work and that you are using these means for the growth and the perfection of your people. Uh, Father, we pray this, that you would give us strength. In Jesus' name, we pray.